I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. We'll have some verses up on the screen as well. Uh, but we'll look at that verse in just a moment. We're going to talk tonight about the power of agreement. All right, the power of agreement. Football season is getting underway. How many are excited? The Broncos won. Actually, I have three teams that I support. The Broncos, the Dolphins, and the, in college, I like the Miami Hurricanes. And all three of them won this weekend. So it's been a good weekend. So the Lord has been, I don't know if the Lord really cares about football, but it's been a good weekend to see uh, my teams win. Uh, football season is underway. How many have ever played football? Flag football or just at recess even, organized football? All right, one of the key elements of football, I think we would all agree if we know anything about it, is that all 11 players on the field kind of have to work together, don't they? If you don't have all 11 players on the field working together, um, the play is not going to be real successful, right? Maybe you saw some plays today where they hiked the ball and the quarterback was expecting the receiver to be over here and he threw the ball over there and all it hit was empty grass. Right? If the 11 players on the field don't all work together on the same play, uh, they're not going to have much success. The opposing team lines up on offense at the line of scrimmage, and all the players on the field have to respond appropriately, appropriately, right? The opposite team. They have to find out who, what, what player are they getting ready to run. They just have a few seconds to decide what this offense is getting ready to do. And all 11 players have to be synchronized or there's not going to be much success. A good team works together, recognizing what offense, what defense are needed, and making sure to be in the right position. This is probably the biggest key. Making sure they're in the right position at the right time. And the power of agreement, we can see that. We can see it in football. We can see it in baseball. There's only nine players in baseball, so it's not quite as bad. But 11 players, can you imagine synchronizing that? What a job for the coach and all those uh, people who sit on the sidelines trying to figure out how to be successful and get that uh, ball over the goal line. You know, the work of God in our lives and in our church requires the power of agreement as well. And that's what we're going to look at tonight in some of these scriptures. Even much more than football, uh, we need to want God's team, don't we? God's kingdom to advance in our day and our, the age that we're living in. And that should be what our heart is really most concerned about. Too many believers today are in disagreement with God and what his word says about their lives. And God's trying to advance his kingdom. He's trying to do a work in our hearts and in our community. And if we're not on the same page, we're not going to advance and have success with what God's wanting to do. Uh, too many are in, in disagreement with what his word says. They're getting sacked by their opposing enemy, the devil. And he's knocking them out of the play. Too many churches, especially in America, are in spiritual decline. And a lot of them are denying that. Denying the decline. They haven't seen a soul saved in years. They haven't seen someone baptized in the Holy Spirit or used of God in the ministry in a long time. And that's spiritual decline. They're dropping in attendance, not being able to pay the bills. You know what? A lot of these churches are busy with activity, but they're never able to advance God's kingdom because uh, they're fumbling the football. They're not. They're getting sacked. They don't know what God wants and what He's directing in the play. Jim Simbola, the pastor I mentioned earlier from Brooklyn Tabernacle Church, Brooklyn, New York, shared that God has shown him that churches are in decline because of divisions, because of infighting, because of the lack of agreement on just about anything. <laughs> Have you been in a church like that? It's not fun, is it? And that's not God's plan for the body of Christ. If our lives are going to avoid being sacked or knocked out, we're going to reach the potential that God has for them. We've got to be in agreement, most of all, with God. We're not always going to agree with each other on everything, are we? Even as believers, as Christians. But we better be in agreement with what God wants. Amen? With what His team is trying to advance in these last days. And that's what we ought to be praying for together when we come to church. And uh, God wants to show us that. If our church, Finished Work Worship Center, is going to avoid the sack, avoid fumbling the football, if you will, reach the potential that God has for us in this community and fulfill all the vision that God's given us to touch lives and to bring just a simple message of the cross to the broken and the hurting in the Colorado Springs and Pikes Peak region, we've got to be in agreement. Amen? We've got to be working together, most of all, with what God wants. And that's what we ought to be praying. God, what do you want? Help us to know your will, to know your direction. I want us to look at two different areas tonight in this message. Number one is the negative power of agreement. All right, look at Genesis chapter 11. You remember what Genesis chapter 11 opens up with? 
It's a story of the Tower of Babel, right? How many remember that story? You've heard that about that story before. Let's look at these verses, and uh, you can see in these verses the negative power of agreement. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they, have one, they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Verse 7, Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old, begat our facts had two years after the flood. So we can see in this story, Genesis chapter 11, these people were united, right? They had agreement, but it was in the agreement for the wrong thing. And uh, you notice it says, let us go down. And who is the us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God put a stop to it because he saw that their agreement was enough to cause some serious problems. And so there can be some negative things in, a, uh, in, in agreement, and we need to avoid those. The people of the earth had come together in agreement against what God's will and his commands were. And the commands that we're talking about, we can see in Genesis chapter 8, in Genesis chapter 9, he tells them, verse 15 through 17 of Genesis chapter 8, we won't read all of those, but the key phrase, the command that God gives in Genesis 8, 15 through 17 is, be fruitful and multiply. This is after the flood, remember? And he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. So what were they doing? They were violating God's will, his direction. He had called the play and said, you need to be fruitful and multiply, and they decided they were going to run another play, Right? It was really astrology. The studying of the stars was why they were building this, tap, this Tower of Babel. And we still have it today, don't we, in 2013, the effects of it? Astrology, when you go to a Chinese restaurant and it has all the signs of the zodiac on the menu. When you open up the newspaper and you read the horoscope to find out how your day is going to be. That comes from the Tower of Babel, the study of astrology, charting the stars to chart the course of our life. And that's not what should chart the course of our life, is it? God should be the one who charts the course of our life. And so God puts a stop to this because they're violating his command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's never a good thing when we agree together against what God wants. And we need to remember that. For the people in this story, what did it bring them? It brought confusion, didn't it? It brought God having to come down and scatter them, make them do what he wanted them to do because they wouldn't do it willingly. Do we want God to have to do that in our own lives? Make us do what he wants us to do because we won't willingly submit? Because that may be what happens. God had to come down and, uh, and work against these people. Do you want what God wants tonight or are you fighting against it? Do you want what God wants in your individual life? Or do you only want what's comfortable and what's convenient? A question each one of us has to ask and analyze about our own life. Do you want what God wants in the church, the leadership that he has raised up, the vision that he has for this church to be a part of our community, uh, to see transformation in these last days. Do we want what God wants? God wants to see souls saved. God's not interest, uh, interested in us just having another cute church service, is he? He's interested in us getting filled up and then going out and exercising with the spiritual food we've received on Sunday, exercising our gifts and our talents and reaching people who don't even know Jesus and bringing them to a place of decision. And so God wants us to be a part of the community transformation that he's wanting to bring about. If we're not in agreement with God, and we're forming other agreements, watch out. I think we can see that from Genesis 11, right? Watch out because God says, if I have to, I'll come down and settle this. 
And he did in this situation, and it wasn't good. He forced them to do what he had just simply asked them to do willingly, and they would re they refused to do it. Because we're in a dangerous place when, we've not, when we're not doing what God wants. Our heart's desire should be, God, I want what you want for my life today, and allow him to lead and guide us. Number two, look at Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. You remember that story? Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It says this, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had just happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. It's a dangerous thing, isn't it? To be in disagreement and even working against what God wants. These people fell dead. Because they were trying to manipulate the things of God for their own benefit, right? Do we have people in the church today that may try and do that? You bet we do. And God doesn't always strike them dead instantly like what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. But there's coming a day of judgment and we don't want to be those people. Amen? We want to be on God's team. We want to be his favorite receiver. Amen? If we're using the football illustration, we want him to be throwing to us all the time. And because he knows, he has confidence that we'll run the play as he wants it to be run. And that's not what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. This husband and wife had agreed together to lie to the Holy Spirit. That's a grave sin. That's a dangerous thing to be doing. Verse 9 tells us. How had Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit? By saying that they sold their land and that they were going to give it all. God, I'm giving it all to you. And they weren't really giving it all. So what were they wanting? They were wanting to be noticed, right? They were wanting men to think they were some spiritual giant. And receive glory that only God should have been receiving. Amen? And there's a lot of people today in the church... The reason they do what they're doing in the church is because they're trying to receive the glory instead of allowing God to receive the glory. And God says in his word, I won't share my glory with another. And so we better make sure that what we're doing is for his kingdom, for what he wants. And uh, by saying that they were going to sell the land for the price that they did, they were giving it all, they were in agreement. Um, to, and you see the husband and the wife both came in and said the same thing. They already hatched out this plan, what we're going to say. And God saw right through it and allowed the apostles to see right through it. And it ended up in their death because they were in disagreement with God's plan. Many churches that are in spiritual decline today are lying to the Holy Spirit, much like Ananias and Sapphira. The members claim to be in agreement with what God wants. They claim to be giving their all. And the reality is they're holding back something for themselves. And just like Ananias and Sapphira were saying, we're giving our all. They were really lying to the Holy Spirit. We're doing the same thing. If we're saying we're giving our all, and sometimes we sing songs on the screen, we better be careful of the commitments that we're making in worship. Amen? I surrender all, that old song. If we're only surrendering half, we better not say I surrender all. Amen? We better make sure that we're really giving God what we say we are. Our worship is a commitment to Him. And if we don't mean it, we'd be better off not singing it. Amen? We'd be better off not making that commitment. And we can see that in the negative agreement that Ananias and Sapphira have made. Isaiah 48, 11, it says this, For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this, God is speaking. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. God wants to be the one who is glorified in what's done, in the play call, if you will, what's being carried out for his kingdom in these last days. And so we better line up with him. The second part of this tonight, the positive power of agreement.
the positive power agreement. What, what can happen when there's positive agreement with what God wants? 1 John 1 9, all of us could probably quote this verse, and we've heard it before. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a powerful verse. And sometimes we have it memorized and it loses its power because it's just kind of you know, in our brains. It's not in our hearts anymore. But what is, what is this verse really saying? It's saying if we say what God says about our lives, about our sins, what does God say about my sin? That's really what confession is. Confession in 2013, because of all the judge programs we have on TV, is fessing up, saying, well, I did it. But confession in this verse is more than just saying, I did it. It's saying what God says, saying, I did it, and God says, I need to change. I need to be righteous. There needs to be a cleansing. There needs to be a washing in my life. And so when we agree with God, and we're not in disagreement, but we're saying what he says about our life, what does he say he'll do for us? He'll forgive us of all unrighteousness. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness and, and set us free from our sins. That's a powerful power of agreement. That's what people that you work with, people in your neighborhood, people in this community need to know about, isn't it? The power of agreeing with God about our sins. When we do that, God can change us. What about prayers answered? Look at Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20. It says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree, see that word there, agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Okay, when we agree as touching any one thing, God, what do you want? And God, I want to bind together with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to pray in agreement with what you want, God. God says there's something powerful about that. There's a breakthrough power in agreement prayer. When we're agreeing, first of all, with what God wants, and then with each other. God, this is what you want in my city. This is what you want in my family. And we begin to pray that way. One person can be powerful, but when all of us begin to agree together, it bombards the heavenlies. And I believe spiritual warfare begins to take place. And God commissions his angels. We, we don't see all this, but I believe that's what the Bible is telling us. He commissions his angels, and he's working in the heavenlies to make his will on earth as it is in heaven when we pray in agreement with what he wants. And I believe that's what that passage is telling us. What about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, talking about the positive power of agreement. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We believe, Acts 2, the end of the chapter, verses 37 and 38, tells us that God still wants to pour the overflow of His Spirit out upon us today in 2013. And how did they receive it on the day of Pentecost? They were all in one accord in one place. Have you been to some churches where that's not true? You're all in the same building. You're all in the same sanctuary. You're all listening to the same passage. But everybody's wanting their own agenda. And God's not moving because everybody's doing their own thing. God can't pour out a spirit unless we're in one accord and in one place. And that's not talking about necessarily a building. It's talking about being in tune with God and what His will is. Knowing what His play call is. Knowing what His game plan is for His kingdom and being lined up with that. These men and women had been in prayer in the upper room since Jesus ascended. Remember that? And went up into heaven. They had been tarrying and waiting for the promise of the Father. Praying and saying, God, send your Holy Spirit like you promised you would. And then God pours it out on the day of Pentecost. What would happen if the church today, if finished work worship center, if the remnant to the body of Christ here in Colorado Springs, because we're not the only church in Colorado Springs that loves God and is getting ready for heaven. There's others. What if we all got together and we said, God, we want what you want. We began to pray and seek for all that God has for us, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We began to pray for God's will and tearing down strongholds in our government and things that are going on in our city that are contrary to what God wants. I believe we would see some powerful things happen. I believe that God wants Colorado Springs to be known for more than just the Air Force Academy or the bad fires that have happened here. 
Amen? More than for the floods that have happened in Manitou Springs or, or Garden of the Gods and the nice things that we have. I think God wants this place to be known as a place where His Spirit is being poured out, where miracles are happening, where good things are happening, not just in one small pocket of our community, but over our entire community. There can be a highway of holiness. God's righteousness flow through here, like Seoul, South Korea, like Brownsville in Pensacola, Florida, like Azusa Street when God began to move in power. If we'll be in agreement with what God wants, God's going to give us some powerful things. What about growth and ministry, uh, growth of the church and ministry? Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, all right, had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And what resulted from all that unity and working together and power of agreement, the Lord added to the church daily. Daily. Are we seeing that today? Not very much. We've got a church on every corner, but we're not having the Lord add daily those who are being saved. We need to see these empty chairs in our church filled up with not transfer growth from another church, but with people that God has used us to reach out to during the week. People who don't even know Jesus right now, but they're coming because they're hungry to hear the good news. And because we've invited them, because we found common ground with them, and we're showing them Jesus. That's how the church was growing and ministry was taking place. They were all working together instead of against each other, right? They weren't worried about the air conditioning and the color of the carpet and all these things that some churches really fight about today. They were, God, what do you want? And God, help us to be plugged in. Help us to be in tune with what you want. Help us to be running the play. God, not fumbling the football, not getting sacked by the enemy and isolated and taken out of the scene. But God, help us to be each member doing our part. Where are we at tonight? Are we on the negative side of the power of agreement like Ananias and Sapphira, like the Tower of Babel, working against, against what God's trying to do? Or are we receiving the benefits of the positive side of the power of agreement? Salvation, prayers answered, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, growth of the church and ministry. Where are we at? Look at this last verse tonight and then we're going to close. Luke 11 Verses 17 through 20. It says, But he, knowing their thoughts, this is talking about Jesus, is the he there. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? But you, because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The power of agreement. If we're working against each other, we're fighting the wrong battles, which is what Satan's got a lot of people who go to church every week doing. Instead of fighting the battle of souls that desperately need to be saved and rescued from hell, we're fighting with each other about things that really aren't going to matter when the trumpet sounds. God's saying we need to unite together in these last days. The time is short. We look at what's going on in Syria. We know the time is short. God's saying there are people whose lives are hanging in the balance. When this life is over, it's either heaven or hell. What you've chosen, whether you accept Jesus and what he did for you at the cross and you spend eternity in heaven, or whether you reject that. And by that, you've chosen for yourself to spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. God wants us to be united, to be in agreement with his plan. And his plan is that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God so loved who? The world. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants everyone to be saved. Not just white, middle class Americans. Amen? He wants us to be reaching the world with the good news of Jesus Christ and in agreement with his plan of salvation. Jesus says in Luke eleven twenty three, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. We're either with Jesus or we're scattering people away from him. What part are we going to have? If we, want, if we want to stop getting sacked and fumbling the football as a church, as the body of Christ, 
If we want to avoid spiritual decline, if we really want to see God's kingdom advanced in us and through us, we must agree together that we want what God wants. And as we close tonight, I want us to say that. There's a lost world, isn't there, that's depending on us saying that tonight. God, we really honestly want what you want. And God, show us what you want. We don't know it all, God, even though sometimes we act like it. God, we don't know it all. We want to know what you want. We want your wisdom. You don't know the opportunities that God's going to bring this week. Young people at school, the people who come across your path that need Jesus, and God's going to give you an opportunity. Adults, as we're walking through our community, the divine appointments that God brings our way, sometimes it's in the inconveniences that the supernatural miracle takes place. Remember, Jesus was going to raise the girl from the dead who had died, and what happened? The woman with the issue of blood presses through the crowd and interrupts Jesus. He didn't have it on his day planner to heal the woman with the issue of blood, did he? It was not a part of his schedule. The things that God does in our life will not always be on our schedule. They may be an interruption, even an aggravation at first. But are we sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to say, God, use me, even if it's an interruption to what I thought I was going to be doing this week? God, I want to be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit. I want to run the play that you're calling for in people getting saved, healed, delivered, set free. I want to be on your team doing what you want me to do. Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to close with a song, and then I want us to pray in response. Every time God speaks to us, he wants a response. For each of us, we're in different places in our spiritual walk, so our response may be different. But what's the response that God wants from you tonight? Are you in agreement with what God's plan is for your life, for your family, for this community? Are we in agreement as a church to move forward with what God wants us to be doing as Finished Work Worship Center here in Colorado Springs? We need to look at those things and ask God what He wants from our lives, the response that He desires from us. We're going to sing uh, Who Can Satisfy, Monica, if you've got that there. As we sing this song, would you just, um, however you feel comfortable connecting with God, if you want to lift your hands, that's fine. If you want to just close your eyes, maybe you want to kneel in your seat. I want us to make an altar of prayer. And uh, let's say, God, I've heard what you're saying to me today, tonight. And God, I want to be in agreement. I want to be working on the positive side of agreement, not on the negative side. And let God do some things in your life. There's people all around you who are depending on the Jesus that shines through your life. And so if there's some changes that God wants to bring, allow God's Holy Spirit to speak to you about that as we sing this and as we close. Who can satisfy my soul?
decision tonight, isn't it? Just to put Jesus back on the throne room of our hearts. And we need to make sin a dethroned monarch in our life. Amen. We shouldn't be controlled by sin anymore. We shouldn't be controlled by the things that the world is controlled by. We need to make Jesus the sovereign king of kings who's ruling and reigning in our lives. So as we close in prayer, I want us to think about what we've been talking about tonight in this message. Maybe you're here tonight and you're unsaved or you've gotten away from God. You've allowed some things in your life that are in disagreement with God. We looked at 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, if we come into agreement with Him, He'll cleanse us from all of those sins. And He'll give us blessing. He'll give us righteousness. And maybe you just need to surrender your life once again. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to Jesus once again. If you'll do that as we close in prayer, I believe God will respond to you. And He'll help you to live a life that's pleasing to Him. Maybe you're here and you're saved, you're living for God. But you know what? You, you don't want to be sacked. You don't want to be taken out of the play. You don't want to fumble the football, as, as it were, like we were talking about in the illustration tonight, in doing God's will. Because of self-will or selfishness or just being too busy or for whatever reason. And maybe you just need to say, God, help me to be more in tune with what you want. What you want for my individual life. God, am I using my talents and my abilities in the way that I should? Am I investing in the local church so that... Uh, the local church can make a difference in the community. Am I doing what I ought to with my time, my talents, my finances? God, maybe speaking to you about that. Maybe you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a po positive, powerful result of being in agreement with God. He says all we have to do is ask. Luke 11, 11 and through, uh, through verse 13. All we have to do is simply ask. God's waiting to pour out His power upon our life. Maybe that's what you need to seek Him about. Maybe there's some people that you know in your life tonight that are lost. They're desperate for Jesus. They don't even know it, maybe, but they're destined for hell because they don't have Christ in their life. They're in the process of dying. That's what the word perishing means, without Jesus in their life. And it's not just going to be one day when they die that they're going to perish, but they're going through a living hell right now, and God wants to use you to reach them. Maybe they need, you need to call out their name in prayer as we close tonight and say, God, give me an opportunity to speak into their life, to make a difference. However God's speaking to you, would you be obedient and respond to him? Give him your heart. Let him do a deep work as we pray tonight. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. God, I thank you that your word exposes the thoughts and the intents of our heart. God shows us where we need to change. And God, I pray that we'll be uh, man enough or woman enough to look in the mirror of your word and to know, God, where you're wanting us to change. God, I pray that we'll not lie to ourselves and be in denial of, God, where we're falling short. But, God, I pray that we'll confess those things to you, that we'll be saying what you say about our life, that we'll be in agreement with you. Because, God, there's so much power in agreement. God, we don't want to be on the negative side like we saw in the, the story of the Tower of Babel where you had to come and confuse their language and scatter them. Because they wouldn't obey, they wouldn't submit. God, we don't want to be on the negative side, Lord, like we saw with Ananias and Sapphira, where they were lying to the Holy Spirit. God, we want to receive salvation. We want to see our prayers answered. God, we want to be baptized with your Holy Spirit. God, we want to see and be a part of the growth and the maturity of your church in these last days. So God, forgive us. God, forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us where we're lacking, where we're failing you. God, give us wisdom and direction, how we can grow and become more the people of God that you want us to be. Fulfilling your game plan, Father God. Fulfilling, God, the things that you want to accomplish for your kingdom in these last days. Lord, we just thank you for that. God, I pray that you'll give us a sensitivity to those around us in our community this week that desperately need Jesus. And give us a holy boldness to share our faith, to plant a seed of the gospel in their lives. Lord, whether it's through prayer or giving them a scripture or meeting a practical need in their life, God, you give us wisdom and direction how we can best connect with those people. But God, help us to be bold and to recognize these people don't have much time and we need to tell them about your truth. God, I just praise you for those opportunities that you're going to bring. Lord, I pray that you will help us to put into practice what we've talked about tonight in our daily devotions and our, our uh, everyday life this week. Help us, Lord, to find application for your word in our everyday life. God, we just thank you for that. Give us a good night. Give us a good week. Keep us close to you throughout the week. Let us be your hands extended in this community throughout the week, we pray. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen.